Artist, author, and activist Robert Hamlin joined Crema Media to discuss his book, Robert, a queer and crooked memoir for the not so straight and narrow. I understand your book took a while to write. Tell us more about the writing process and some of the pain and happiness you had in confronting and revisiting those early childhood memories. I think one of the first questions, and many times over, people asked me when the book had been finally launched. It took me five years to write it, so there was a lot of pressure. And finally, when it was published, people were like, well, is this a healing process? And I said over and over, no, (laughs) it is not a healing process, especially not if you're writing it during the first lockdown in a world pandemic, all the uncertainty. But I think the healing came later when I could interact with people about it. So just sitting in a room and confronting your own pain and your own memories and trying to to defrag all that on your own is a painful thing. But the thing about publishing a book is, first of all, it's a bit of a burn when you get out of there, all the attention. But when you start having people that come back at you and say, wow, thank you, we had the same experience, or people challenging you intellectually to re-look at some of the stuff that you had and bringing their experiences, in that came a healing. So, yeah, it was, it was painful. Suffering is awful. But this wasn't suffering. It was hardship. And hardship gives, one's a, gives one an opportunity to overcome and for, for meaning to follow. So it was an incredible experience to, to, to have it and to write the book and to be published the way that I was. The opening scene is of a gay father, your father, coming to terms with his sexuality in a time and place when it was difficult and dangerous to be gay. Tell us more about his journey through fatherhood and how this impacted you later on in your life, having only met him in your teenage years. I think maybe, I mean, there's lots of questions in there, so I'm just going to pick something. I think a a theme here that jumped out for me was adoption. Um, I was adopted by my mother's second husband. And for all the grace of that, of having two parents, there is also the pain and displacement of being an adoptee something I'm confronted with still every day because I have adopted a child. So as much as you have all this supposed um, balance by having two parents and the love love of that, there is a body pool. And I have learned that as a trans person, someone longing for their gender and living in a society that wants to limit people on gender, my body, it was my body that was pulling me to something else. We don't understand yet, like, what do our bodies do with gender? You know, we're still just trying to cling to what is society telling us what must gender be. But the same with parenthood, the body that you originate from. And I remember as a child really, really longing for my father. Um, as much as I had this other father, this my adopt- adopted father that was playing that role beautifully, there was this longing for a mirror. And I can only say the word mirror in retrospect because the longing didn't have a word. There was just a bodily longing for something. And I somehow knew in all my inexperience as a young person that it was about a parent. As a trans person, I think the journey is a bodily one. As a young person, you know that your body is asking you for something and you can attach it to gender, which is a social construct so that little bridge is happening. And as an adopted child, your body is also longing for something and you don't have enough long uh, knowledge yet, but your mind does know in some way that it's linked to being a parent. And so, you know, I had a gay father. I knew it from a very small age. In the book, there's these problematic descriptions and now my mother bumbles through trying to explain to me that I have a gay father and what gayness means and my curiosity about it. And can I also be as a girl gay? Um, and so the pool was there. And I think at the age of 14, I asked my mom to meet my father, which she refused and which brought a whole set of pain for the family and things to process. But then the day that I met him, all those feelings and longings for which I didn't have words for. And this is an important narrative for us to also learn in all these new identities that we are openly and painfully discovering in, in life at the moment and in society. There is a body pool. And when you meet your birth parent, whether you're going to have a relationship with them or not, there is something that gets satisfied. There's some kind of mirror that comes together that is a puzzle piece that you, you really need. 
Of course, in this case, it was also interesting because my father was queer, right? And even though he was a gay man and I was on my way to something totally different, there was a satisfaction in that, that I was being raised in a cisgender heterosexual environment that was very not meeting how I felt about myself. And so um, as dangerous it is, as it was to go into this father, my father's life that was uh, of a queer man and a con man, uh, somebody that is using drugs and partying and all kinds of stuff, the satisfaction of finding a mirror that you had longed for your whole childhood, there's a kind of a safety in that, in finding your feet and, and, and it being a truthful and, and authentic self that you're finding. So it was an incredible, uh, uh, dangerous journey to go on. But, you know, again, the transcendence of it brought an authentic life for me. Your father also had difficulty in tolerating, never mind accepting your physical appearance in terms of your gender identity. As the book progresses, you explore more loosely and increasingly with a male-leaning aesthetic. Tell us about your journey in finding your gender identity and the complications that arose from this with your father and other key characters in the book. Yes, that's a very um, painful thing that was being broke open there between the two of us because as, as much as my father had, uh, as a gay man in the 60s, um, uh, left behind heterosexual life and went to live an amazing uh, queer life of the 70s and the 80s where he was dancing in clubs in London, you know, the famous club Heaven, and having that community in secret, which is painful because he got gay bashed in his life and his family rejected him. But there was always that close knit thing of a rejected community that had, had found um, one another. And even though that was going on and my father was allowed to have his, well, he had allowed himself in this community that he had found to have his sexuality, he was still bucking under keeping himself safe in society. And for that, he needed to perform a heterosexual man. And for that, he had to pre perform a masculine shape which would always crumble, of course, the moment he got drunk, because then his wrists would start going this way, left way and right way. And he would be much more fun, of course, and full of beautiful stories. Um, the authentic him would be an incredible person to, um, to experience. But, you know, the reason he was doing all that was to keep safe. And for her, like any parent today also con confronted with a queer child, their first concern is for the safety of their child. You know, who will love my queer child? Will my queer child's body be safe? Uh, will my queer child get a body? And so just because he understood his own queerness, it doesn't mean he, he didn't worry for my safety. And the thing is also, he didn't worry with it in the front of his mind. There was still that internalized thing that queer people have. It's like, I'm doing something wrong and I'm just making it as I go every day. And so I've got to teach my kid to just like wing it as well. And I remember him, you know, having that internalized fear of gender like uh, queer people have. There's that thing in, in queer society still um, when people are looking for a date on, a, queer, on a, a dating app. No fats, no femmes, no, you know, nothing that is like transcending gender or making any gender mistakes as, as, as we would have it. And so when he started seeing me wanting to wear his shirts, all that stuff came up for him that comes up for every person that doesn't have knowledge or hasn't managed to break that stuff away. Um, his child isn't going to be safe. And we live it out by performing stigma ourselves, even though we hate it on ourselves. And he would try to discourage me all the time and, or he would try to bend it. Like I'd want to wear his suits, always wanted to wear his suits. And there's a, a long and lots in the book about the narrative about suits and me fitting in his suits. But I was only allowed to wear it if I wore it without a shirt and show my breasts. You know, sort of the, our, the um, gender breakers in history before us, like David Bowie and Malena Dietrich, you know, that made it sexy to do it. But at the same time, still acknowledging their birth gender. That was all I was allowed to do. And pushing through all that, I, 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 it was really painful. I didn't want to express femininity. I could see the power in it. I could see the power and the attention I got for showing my breasts and, and transcending gender in a way that was acceptable to everybody else. But it just still didn't feel like me. And so it caused a lot of tension between us. I made a small movie about us, about um, if you're gay, you don't have to be a man. And if you're, you know, a lesbian, you don't have to be a man. And that kind of, you know, that kind of stuff. So it was this constant exploration that was painful for both of us because we didn't have the internet that we have now and all the knowledge that we can just gain from other people. So the internet has changed a lot for, you know, for changing those dynamics between people.
in your words, what are your key takeaways from your book? Well, seeing from the reaction, I think what I've been successful in is to leave those questions open for people. Uh, the book is not academic. The book is not a handbook for anybody. If you think you're going to find answers in there um, that are going to be in uh, bullet points or academic uh, frames or psychiatry of today, it's not there. It's a story. I was telling a story. There are love stories in there. There are sex stories in there. And I'm hoping to leave people with many, many more questions than answers. And I mean, that sounds a bit brutal or sadistic, but it's not. Because often when we don't have information, we are stuck in the same questions all the time. And inside of our heads, we just have the same answers for ourselves, which aren't real answers and which has, has us stuck. But when we have new questions and new lives to examine, when artists do that for you, it's like taking gender identity, whatever you thought of it, and taking sexual orientation and just mishing and mashing it all up. It gives us new perspectives and it gives your brain a chance to reroute all those neural pathways that you've just been stuck in and, and unable to explore and rearrange in your own brain. And so the idea with the book was that it should be that kind of an artwork that gives you a new perspective or gives you an opportunity to mix things up. But I'm giving so much affirmation for the book and, and thank yous for the book. And sales are also going great, which means, you know, people are, are telling one another, um, buy this book, you know, you need it. But what happens in the end is, is, um, is that an artist has done their job. What do you hope those who are straight and narrow will take away from your book? Well, I put that warning on the front of the book, hey, a queer and crooked memoir for the not so straight and narrow. And there was so much debate about that at my publishing house and between all my mentors and my friends. It's like, isn't that putting the people that you actually want to be talking to off? And I was like, I just want to talk to everybody. And those kind of straight lines that we think about how marketing works is not really true. Lots of times people feel challenged by an attack. If I see by the people that are coming to friend me on Facebook and I go and see what their lives are about, there's lots of straight and narrow people that have picked up that book. People want to change, you know, but people, this is the beauty of a book. You get to do that in the privacy of your inner rooms and in your house without having been gazed at. Theater also works like that. You can sit in the dark and the story can be told to you and you can at your own own pace and with your own feelings come to to change and so saying that was a challenge to to people and packaging these the the story in the way that i did in a book form i think brings the the comfort of it so i think people will find from it what they want i mean i'm getting lots of messages back from people that i'm like oh okay that's not exactly what i'm about but <laughs> let me not disrupt your process you know um, if you've put yourself in the light as an artist, you're kind of putting yourself in as a teacher and you have to, the way that, I, the best way that I've seen with my child and the school that she's in is to teach children, is to trick them, is to trick them into seeing the pictures that they need and absorbing it in the way that they need. And so I'm hoping people will just find things, whatever they need in it. If you need to find a sexy story that's like word porn for you, fine, have a good time. If you need to see a queer love story, if you need to see some woman-on-woman -woman sex happening, then that's in there for you. If you need to see some gay men, like, you know, triumph over the system, then it's in there for you. You know, it's not the singular story. If you need to see somebody on their way recovering from racism, on their way, I'm not quite there yet, it's in the story. But it's a nice big old mess. So, yeah, lots of uncertainty. Just enjoy it with me. What advice would you give to someone questioning and or exploring their gender identity and sexuality, especially in South Africa, a country sometimes unwelcoming to anyone other than those who are cisgender and heterosexual? You know, don't be alone. You, I think when it comes to people that have uh, sexual orientation issues, finding a community and the joy of sexuality and desire is one thing. And you will, you will find someone to love. And there are many ways today to do that. It's not so easy when you're struggling with your gender identity because you're not necessarily going to enjoy other trans people just because they are also trans. In fact, you're going to hate the mirror of that. But you need to find one person. And so when I was doing work at organizations, I always used to try and introduce people and say to them, 
This doesn't have to be your best friend or your family, but this is your transition buddy. This is just someone that knows what you're going through when you're trying to change your documents. This is someone that knows what you're going through when your hormones are really messing with you and you can't find a straight or a cis person to you know, understand what you're going through. Don't be alone. You know, reach out. And don't be scared of medicine, for God's sake. You know, we resist medicine all the time and we shouldn't. Um, I have a, another challenge, bodily challenge in my life. I've got some pretty serious ADHD. And I resisted that diagnosis until I was 53. It was okay because I was an artist, but eventually when I gave into that, when the pressure of the pandemic and writing a book and having to work in teams became too much, um, I you know, started taking medication and it helped me through it. And on the other side, I'm off the medication again. And I think when people are confronted with these terrible issues and there's a disruption in their communities because of their orientation or because of their gender identity, depression ensues. And I think I would really suggest to medical professionals, you know, very carefully, but give people the medicine they need to get through these, these times. Medicine and other interventions, of course, you know, mental health care, communities, uh, support groups. Uh, keep flowing. You can't be hiding. Don't be alone. We're really exploring in society what to do with our children that have gender identity issues. And something I've come into with my own godchildren who are teenagers now, is as parents, people have to see the difference between a transgender child um, who has an actual medical condition going on and a child that is now in a time that we are using gender identity as one of the explorations for the things they can play with. You know, you'll find a child, children, groups of children, or you'll see girls like exploring, like I'm this model or I'm this actress, and they give one another different names. That's an age old thing in children discovering their identity. But now gender comes into it. So with like my, my godchild and her, her, her 10 friends that are in a gang, three of them have decided they're gender non-binary, given themselves names like Max and Alex, and they, they're loving it. They're not going to their parents going like, oh, what a transition. But their parents are panicking about it, thinking that perhaps you have a transgender child here. Big difference. Just allow your child to, to see the options and to, to work through it with their friends because children will work it out with one another. But when you're having a transgender child who has an actual medical condition going on, we don't know so much about it yet, but there are diagnoses. You will see depression, uh, children that cut, cut themselves, uh, isolation, loneliness. Um, that's a totally different thing. And for that, you can't fix that and their friends can't fix that. Um, and, and the whole world's going to tell them that they're wrong. And you as a parent need to not be another person telling them they're wrong. You as a parent need to seek help for your child. You need to find professional help. And that doesn't mean a life coach that's at your uh, whatever community you're in. It means a professional that deals with transgender health. Um, look it up yourself. Go to the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. You can start there. There's many, many, many resources. Uh, local organizations like Triangle Project, uh, Gender Dynamics, um, iranti.org. All those people will lead you for, to professional help with a child that actually has a diagnosis. That, need, that needs to be the intervention over there. Also, as a parent, don't be alone in this. That was author Robert Hamblin talking to Creamer Media about his book, Robert, A Queer and Crooked Memoir for the Not-So-Straight and Narrow.